Hello, everyone, and welcome to Intuit Tech Stories. Good morning, good afternoon, and maybe good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you for being here. Tech Stories are a series of virtual events where you can experience our cutting edge technologies and how Intuit uses them to power prosperity around the world. Our technology leaders will share in-depth topics with you to help you learn, grow, and hone your craft. So again, welcome. Today's Tech Stories webinar is titled, Demystifying Software Architecture. Now, before we kick things off, we hope that you and your loved ones are well. And we know that we all live and work in unprecedented times with COVID. And we recognize that many of you may be struggling with balancing work and life. Thank you for being here and we're sending all of you good vibes and well wishes. Now I'd like to take a moment to share the inspiration for today's Tech Stories webinar. For me, there were two catalysts. My name is Alisa Carpio. One is that I have an opportunity to work globally at Intuit. And one of the consistent questions I always get from engineers are, what is the role of an architect in our team? Or how can I become an architect? Now, the second source of inspiration is from the Intuit chief architect, Alex Balage, And he and I have ongoing conversations about differentiating between what is architecture, the discipline itself, and the role of architects. Both of these inspired me to reach out to the awesome technologists that you're about to meet. And yes, they are probably like a set of my most favorite people. Also, the timing for this season is great because there's quite a few conferences focused on architecture, which is gathering a lot of buzz. And so I just wanna share these with you um, just to name a few. Recently, two of our panelists, and that's Lena and Denise, and you'll be hearing from them soon, um, they were part of Grace Hopper's Mentoring Circles, and that was held on October 2nd. Upcoming is October 19th to the 23rd is Europe Cloud Summit. Now, Edward Lee from Intuit is keynote speaker, but Michael, who is also part of this panel, um, and you'll be hearing from him soon, is in the steering committee and will also be speaking there. November 16th to the 20th is QCon SF. November 19th to the 20th is International Conference on Software Architecture and Common Architectural Styles. On November 30th to December 18th is AWS reInvent, um, and Denise is speaking there. And then December 7th to the 10th is ArcConf, ArcConf 2020. So just a lot of things going on around the world of architecture. Would love for you all to consider joining that, especially those where we have both Michael and Denise um, as, as speakers. So thank you. Now, before our panelists' um, introductions, I'd like to take a moment to go over some virtual housekeeping. So please submit any questions you may have during this discussion in the Q&A box below. Now, this event is being recorded, and we are going to send out an email with the link to the event recording. And then finally, after the webinar, please fill out our quick four question survey at the end to help us plan for future events. And we do um, you know, read through all of the uh, verbatims and all of the feedback to ensure that we continue to create amazing content for all of you. Okay, so now, finally, 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 we're going to be uh, joined by our awesome set of um, architects, our technologists, um, and they each represent a specific domain. Now, panelists, we're gonna start with David, then Denise, Lena, then Michael. As you introduce yourself, please share your name, your role at Intuit, and a bit about your background. And then also, please answer the following question. What is the first thing you are going to do once it's safe to step out and no longer self-isolate? So let's start with David. Hey everyone, I'm David Stone. Uh, I work on hey. our user experiences here in the, consumer, in the consumer group at Intuit. So I work on things like Mint and TurboTax. Um, if it involves painting pixels on a screen, uh, I'm, I'm kind of in charge of that slash responsible for that. Um, <laughs> Let's see, I've worked here for a little over six years. I've been doing software development for a lot more than that. Um, and what is the first thing that I'm gonna do when I'm done quarantining? Uh, I, I will say that I really miss going on date nights with my wife. I, we love to go like uh, out to a, a nice dinner and then go see plays. And um, I really miss the theater. That is like one of the things that I, I didn't realize that I was missing until I was like, oh, we haven't done that in forever. And it, it, I know it's only been months, but it feels like it's been an eternity. So that's, I think, the first thing that I really want to get back to. Thank you. 
Denise. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Denise McInerney. I'm a data architect at Intuit. I've actually been with the company 16 years. Um, and uh, my focus as a data architect now is uh, planning and building out analytic solutions to support all of our analysts, data scientists, data consumers. Um, I've actually been in data my entire tech career. I started out as a database administrator. I've been an analyst. I've been a data engineer. So I spent my whole time on the data tier. Um, so what am I most looking forward to? Uh, really anything that happens in three dimensions, I would say. Uh, but one thing is going back inside the yoga studio to take a yoga class as opposed to my living room. And I am with Dave. I really miss live entertainment. I had tickets to two concerts this summer. I had gotten online like at 10 a.m. when the tickets went on sale. I was very excited about both of them. And of course, they both got postponed. They were postponed to 2021. So I'm hopeful that we will actually get to go to them. So that's another thing I'm really looking forward to. Thanks, Denise. Lena. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, I'm Lena Sampemane, an enterprise architect at Intuit. I actually cannot believe it's eight years uh, since I joined as the lead architect for Intuit's monetization platform. Uh, I did that for five and a half years, and in my current role, I drive various cross-company architecture initiatives, such as managing its technology capability map, uh, privacy data rights compliance, uh, M&A due diligence, and others. Uh, prior to joining Intuit, uh, I spent 15 plus years at Oracle in architecture and product management roles, designing and delivering enterprise software. Uh, and the first thing I'm looking to uh, once it's safe is to have a reunion with my siblings. I normally meet, try to, we try to get together at least once a year and now it just feels so long since we've gotten together, all of us with our families. Thanks, Lena. Michael. Hi, my name is Michael Kalika. Great to meet you and thank you for joining us. I'm site uh, architect in Israel and I'm three and a half years into it. And uh, one of my uh, focus role here is fraud detection, security R&D, data acquisition and others. So I work with a variety of business units. And before joining into it, I spent 11 years at Hewlett Packard and two years at Payoneer, which is another part of the companies. I think that when this lockdown finished, hopefully for Israel next week, I'll just grab my telescope and go for a few nights in the desert to for stars and deep space objects. Wow. Wow. And I have seen some of your pictures. They're amazing, Michael. Thank you. No, awesome, everyone. Thank you to our panelists for being here. Um, let's go ahead and get started. So I'm going to start with you, Denise. When, um, and then the rest of the panel, please jump in with your thoughts as well. When I ask an engineer or you know, any other technologist, um, what is software architecture and what is the role of the architect? I get a huge range in terms of mm -hmm. how those things are defined. Now, starting with you, Denise, how would you define, what are your thoughts around what is architecture and software? And how do you, how do you define the role of the architect? So I think one of the reasons you get a range of answers to that is there is a pretty broad range of architects as even represented here today in this webinar. Um, and a lot of the variance comes with the domain, either the technical domain and or the business domain, right? Because both are the purview of the architect. But I think there are some commonalities um, that cross those boundaries. And really an architect and software architecture is thinking about systems end to end, thinking about the components of systems, how they work together, how they interact with other systems. That I would say is common, whether you're talking about front end or data or anything in between. Um, what's the role of the architect? Well, to be responsible for all of that. Um, I like this quote from Martin Fowler. Martin Fowler is the chief scientist of ThoughtWorks. He writes a lot about software and uh, software development and the craft. And um, he wrote some blog posts on software architecture. And at the end of it, he said, well, at the end of the day, um, the, the architect is the person who worries about the important stuff. And I have to say, that's how I view my job, right? Worrying about the important stuff. Because for these systems to work, we have to make sure that the important stuff works. So uh, I like that summation of the role of the architect. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Michael, Lena, David, anything that you would add? So I think that uh, software and system architecture is basically from a more artistic perspective. This, this is something that you wish to change or do differently when you finish the project. But from the practical side, I think that it's a common and shared 
knowledge about uh, system characteristics and the uh, system design patterns by uh, software experts in the industry. And I would rather say that system architecture is also a reflection of corporate values and uh, the engineering culture. I actually uh, like to, uh, you know, Grady Boot, who developed a UML or the Unified Modeling Language, he actually describes what we do as SCARs, uh, which I proudly wear, actually. It's separation of concerns, crisp and resilient abstractions, balanced responsibility distribution, and always striving for simplification. Right, and if I had to simplify that, I would say we like to define who does what, which is the capability allocation, the why, which is the principles, and how, which are the patterns, right, within a system or a solution. Yeah, and I think one of the things that really differentiates, um, like just when I think back on my career and, and being an engineer, like leading a team, right, and I, I was responsible for the architecture of the pieces that I was working on. One of the things that's really different about the role that I have today is that you know, I, I tend to think more cross-cutting and I tend to go, okay, what can I, what can we build in to this system so that the engineers who are leading the teams that are working on an individual feature or a set of features can be faster at their jobs and can like worry less about the things that they really shouldn't be worried about. Um, and that's, you know, it can range from anything from security or data to uh, you know what user experience framework we pick or you know how they get front end logs from the browser all the way back into Splunk so that we can make sure that things are going correctly. And so trying to like look at that holistic view to say where are the areas of opportunity that we can take sort of some responsibility or some burden away from the engineers so that everyone can live a little bit better of a life and not have to worry about some of the things that slow you down. I love what all of you shared because you really are talking about the breadth and depth, right? And, and all the things that you all in your role have to think about as you work with teams. Um, and it's amazing to just hear that. And I know Denise started with, you know, Elisa, the reason why you're hearing such a huge range is because the role um, if not only evolves, but there's so much that it could be in the way that you all define it is amazing. Now, Michael, you are based in Israel and your role is site architect. Can you tell us what that is and how does that differ from a role that's, let's say, an architect focused on one of Intuit's products? So it's a big difference. When I was part of Mean as a bill pay architect or payment architect in QuickBooks, my accountabilities and responsibility were in certain areas of those products. As a site architect, my vision and my responsibilities and accountabilities are much broader. So my focus areas now are, for example, how we attract uh, the best talent to Intuit and how we help existing talent at Intuit to grow. That's one area. Other area is, uh, for example, uh, I'm involved in uh, take some technology decisions uh, where it's needed and that requires me to go and do some technical analysis with the team and, and help them make the right decisions using some architecture principles and decide what's the right thing to do with them. And I'm also playing a very active and impactful role in site leadership team in our site. And uh, I represent the voice of engineers in everything we do. And because I'm in a unique position that I'm not part of any group, I have a broader view of, uh, with the, of uh, the multiple business units. And that puts me in a unique position where I can create different collaboration opportunities for innovation between uh, those units or even regions. And uh, last but not least, I also represent Intuit and technologies in different uh, internal, external forms. And the big difference is that you are not part of any team and you work with many of them. And that requires not just technical skills and abilities, it also requires some people skills like communication, leadership, and in this role, it's even more. And thank you for, for sharing that. I, I um, Site architects are such a, you all are a little bit of a unicorn in, in that way. So it's pretty cool how you described it. Thank you. Now, now I'm gonna switch things a bit. Um, starting with you, David, then Lena. Um, how does one become an architect? And maybe you could share a bit about your journey. And then I'll also ask Denise and Michael to jump in, um, but David, we'll start with you then, Lena. I think, uh, you know, what's interesting about becoming an architect is, you know, there's sort of a, a conflation of two things. Like there's the job of software architect where that's like your title. 
um, which sounds very official and is, you know, very, very important. Um, but then there's the role of architect, which is, you know, like I said earlier, like when I was a staff engineer on a team working on a set of features, I, I played that role on that team, right? And it, it isn't just staff engineers, it could be a SWE one. Uh, if a SWE one, you know, to Denise's earlier quote, like worries about the important things, they're playing the role of architect. Like, and so it's really just a, a mindset about how to think about things and how to think about systems and software and how they, how they fit together. Um, and I, I think I sort of recognized probably not necessarily like super early on in my career, but um, you know, I started out in engineering. I think most people do. Um, and the, I, I, you know, I worked on different teams and different companies and stuff like that. And I sort of gravitated over time towards thinking about not just, oh, I, you know, I'm going to sit down and write this feature and I'm going to, I'm going to obsess over this one piece. I started to really, in, you know, see in myself that I enjoyed thinking about how all the pieces fit together and thinking like, oh, if we plug this into that over there, then we can get these extra things for free. Um, and so when I, when I came to Intuit, I was a staff engineer. I worked on that team. I played that role. And over time, I gradually started thinking more broadly, uh, just in not on my own team, but in terms of like the other teams that I was working with. And I, uh, in my head, I thought I was ready for the job of architect. And it wasn't until my boss came to me, my current boss came to me, uh, our chief architect, and she, she said, you know, you're a great staff engineer. I'd like to have you on my team. And I was like, I mean, sure, of course, I, I think I can do this. And then about uh, two months into the job, I was like, oh God, I was totally unprepared for this. I, <laughs> I did not know what I was signing up for. <laughs> um, and so, so I think it's, you know, two things. There's, there's the role, which anyone can do. And then there's the job, which actually requires a whole set of other skills that I thought I had and found out that I, I still needed to work on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Lena, what are your thoughts? Yeah, sure. So I think just like David, I started out as an engineer. In fact, I don't believe I know any architect that did not uh, start out in engineering. Uh, I started out as a software engineer in the order management application within the Oracle Enterprise Suite. And what drove me was learning how we use technology to address a problem space, right? More than the technology itself, that's what actually uh, interested me. And how the piece I was building was designed to fit in within the product and how the product integrated with the other upstream and downstream products and those integrated with other products in the application suite, right? To automate the code to cash or the broader concept to care uh, business process. And soon I had a very large uh, view, or rather a very broad view of the domain and a deep understanding of the subdomains within it. I should also add that I actually had the good fortune of being, I had a mentor who was a, a, an architect and seeing the impact that she had. And I thought that, wow, she just knew everything. And I was at Oracle and I used to think she's the Oracle, like she knows everything. And I was like, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be, right? And but I didn't kind of know how to, just by following my th thirst or curiosity to know how the pieces uh, fit together, uh, guess what? With like within four years, I was the architect for the order management application, right? Because just because I had uh, th that knowledge and, and just continue to expand on that, right? And along the way, I learned about different industry variations and the complexity that they brought to the table. Right, so this uh, continuous journey of learning and the love of the problem space, I think is what led me from one role to another as an architect, like a, a different kinds of architecture, like whether it's integration architect or a solution architecture or platform and in my career journey and brought me to what I do today, so. Thank you for sharing um, your journey as well. Denise or Michael, did you wanna add anything um, to this question? I sort of got into it because I, similar to Lena and David, I think this is the commonality, right? We all have a vision of what something can be or should be. And so I mentioned at the top that I had done several roles in data. I was an analyst for a while and it became clear to me that we were not able to do what we wanted to do in analytics because we didn't have the right kinds of systems or tools or platforms. And that actually led me to playing the role of architect for one sort of vertical. Uh, analytic solution, which is what led me to the, the broader um, data architect role that I have today. But I think the commonality is having a vision and having some idea of how you can get to that vision. Well said. Michael, anything? 
you'd add? Well, I think that my career was never etched in the stone to become an architect. And I'm actually switching between architecture and management roles all the time every few years. <laughs> And everything started when I joined Hewlett Packard as a tech lead. And uh, after three or four months, I was asked to step in and uh, temporarily be a, tech, a team lead or project manager. Temporarily. And, that tempor <laughs> and that temporarily became 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's yours. Take it. <laughs> yeah, kind of help us save the world. And, uh, and then, but... And being manager still, I was very connected to my engineering team. So I did uh, hands-on work, be it some coding or doing some uh, technology proof of concept and bringing new technologies or doing code review or everything that is required to help my team to be successful. So I, and even that was not enough for me. I also always had some pet projects at home. And at some point of time, I decided that if I love it so much, so why not? make it my career path so i switched to architecture then i found myself again in the management role and then i returned back to architecture <laughs> and i think that today my unique position where i can enjoy actually in both of the worlds because as a manager you help to grow the teams you to attract best talents and uh, as architect you are also engineer so you it's a more creative role you solve many complex problems and I think that today I can combine and enjoy from both of the worlds. Well, thank you. Each of you um, have had your own journey and it's so inspiring. And um, I, I'm already seeing questions um, with what you all are sharing from, from the audience. And we'll get to those questions soon. I'm going to switch things up and this is going to be like rapid fire. Any of the panelists can just jump in and it's going to be about stereotypes. Um, and I know you all have good humor, so some of this might like hit home, but um, you know, it's, it's a bit of fun, but I also, th these are stereotypes and we'd love to hear from you, um, your thoughts on it. So the first one, architects draw boxes many times on whiteboards and sometimes in the air. Go for it, whoever. I think it's uh, akin to saying uh, comic writers draw boxes, right? Boxes uh, serve a purpose, in my opinion. I actually once did a whole session on this meme where I said, hey, I'm an architect and I draw boxes, right? So we use boxes and, you know, other lines and shapes uh, in capability allocation diagrams and process diagrams and entity relationship diagrams, right? And various other artifacts that we create as part of our design documentation to communicate a system or solution architecture and design. So you know, a, a picture is a thousand words, as they say. So I, you know, but that's not, that's not it, the only thing we do, right? We do a lot more things besides uh, draw boxes, but we definitely need those boxes for sure. Yeah, I, I love drawing boxes. I, I think it's an awesome part of my job. I mean, I, I desperately miss being in the office and like going up to a whiteboard with some engineers or with other architects and sitting down and going like, okay, this is how we're going to do it. And just like sitting there drawing. Um, because it, it gives us all sort of a plan and it gives us a way to sort of uh, think about how we're going to approach a problem, right? It's never, I'm not drawing boxes for, for boxes sake. Um, I mean, sometimes I, I do so that I can practice getting like the squared edges and stuff like that. And I, I make sure the lines are straight, but um, that's just for my OCD neatness sake. Um, it's really, you know, it's, it's just about making sure that we're all working on the same sort of map of how, how this all fits together. You can, everyone's um, drawing some mental map in their head in every conversation. Every engineer is thinking, right? And by actually committing to a diagram, even if it's changing, that helps crystallize everyone's, com everyone's focus onto that. And it's where you start to tease out where people are having misunderstandings or different ideas. So I think that the, the, the boxes and the arrows that connect them are a really important part of communicating and thinking through design for the whole team. So I, I wear that stereotype proudly. But as a data architect, you also draw cylinders. Cylinders, right? yes, I draw course. cylinders. Also, we now have to draw big data. So that's, you know, it's a whole different, you know. Is that just a cloud? Straight line at yes. the bottom? Well, we draw the cloud a lot, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you guys kill me. Okay, here's another one. Um, architects design solutions. They don't build them. I think that uh, this is... Uh, it, this is not correct because good architects actually they don't just do, draw diagrams and they just because they don't just tell people what to do they must be connected to the ground to the team 
and sometimes it might require some coding sometimes it might require some uh, reviews or doing some proof of concept or whatever they should be committed to their team's success sometimes even not have their own office and sit with the team in the shared open space even at that level and uh, that's why i think that we, we should be very very connected I, I agree with that. At the same time, we are very dependent on the engineering teams actually bringing those visions to light, right? They're, they're, and, and that connection to what they're doing, you really have to listen to the engineers um, and adjust your design when they run into something, which is always going to happen, right? The, the first rev of the design or even the fifth rev is usually not the thing that ends up in production because when you get your feet on the ground, you realize something didn't work as advertised or the documentation that you based your recommendation on actually was incorrect or whatever it is. Um, so I think that it's very simpatico relationship, but you have to be respectful of the engineer's experience on the ground as they're trying to actually implement something. And if you actually sit down and like try to use the system and, and that's the best way is to experience the same pain, right? Like I can, uh, you know, I can think that my design of something will be correct, but then as soon as I sit down and I'm like, okay, I'm going to open IntelliJ or VS code and I'm going to sit down and I, I like go to start using it. And I'm like, oh, this is ugly and it is painful to use. And I've got to like, okay, now I have to go switch over to this terminal and I have to like simlink this or I have to, you know, how do I find the Splunk log for this? I mean, I, the other day I was trying to find some Splunk logs for, uh, you know, getting some A-B test treatments through from our, uh, you know, through a bunch of systems to our, one of our mobile applications. And I was like, okay, where is the Splunk index for this? Where, what format is this log in? And it, it, it was just like, oh, no one has really sat down. No one who designed the system has really sat down to figure this out because uh, if they did, they would have gone, oh, this is hard. And, and again, you're just trying to make things, like the, the whole goal of this job is to make things easier. So if you find pain that the engineers are going through, that is often the most beneficial thing to go tackle because you'll, you'll create a system that is better and it'll save everybody a lot of time and heartache. Well said. Um, now, some of you have already talked about the word design, um, and I'm actually going to focus a little bit on that. And I'm going to start with you, Lena. You and I have had several conversations about design and the importance of having good design in software or even in systems. And I've heard you say that everyone should be thinking about good design, and it's not just about the architect. It's not just the architect who should be thinking about good design. Can you share more about what you mean about good design or design in general? And then the rest of the panelists, please do add. So Lena, we'll start with you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Alisa. Uh, so I, I think we all love technology, but technology does not live in a vacuum, right? It's, it serves a purpose. So good design is making sure that all the pieces of the larger solution cohesively fit together, right? To address that problem well and have all the elites as we talk about them, right? The usability, the flexibility, the scalability, right? And, and so on. And an architect, uh, for example, an end-to-end -end architect drives cross-functional design with capability allocation and behavior requirements for each component and how, and how they should behave. But then the lead engineer for the component should also apply that same design mindset in terms of understanding the role that component plays in the overall solution and design the pieces of the solution component that they own to be cohesive, right? So their piece of the larger solution itself can be a world in its own right. And is there anything within their component that can be simplified? Is there something that doesn't add up that can have broader repercussions? Thinking about that, raising those questions, uh, accounting for the cloudy day scenario, not just thinking about the sunny day, that is something everybody should be, should be doing, right? That's, and, you know, and, and so on. That, that's, what I, that's what I think, so yeah. David, Michael, Denise, would you like to add to that? I think that good design basically basically means great system qualities. And when we talk about quality, we mean requirements, and requirements mean conform uh, conformance to business needs or customer needs. So it's highly essential for anyone who's dealing with design, be it architect or lead engineer, to be customer obsessed, to connect with you, know who your customers are, external, internal. Maybe they are data analysts, maybe they are front-end engineers who use your API or whomever it is, we need to find them. Maybe they have positive interest towards what you are building. Maybe they have negative. 
and then we need to tackle that and make them part and include that this is part of the inclusion and then share the feedbacks. Yes, we use draw diagrams, create those diagrams, but those are visual stories that we share with them, create feedbacks and reiterate. And at the end we create a design that everyone respects and uh, meets business problem. That's most important. I'll jump in here just on the thing about data and good design and data. Um, when uh, sorry, when some of the data engineers are working on something new and they want to talk about a design, some of the things I'm looking for is, are we thinking about security? Like, what, is, is your system secure? Are we thinking about with data performance? I mean, performance with everything, but especially with big data, obviously the amount of data we're dealing with has <laughs> drives performance a lot, right? So yes, it works with your tiny little test file. How does it work with the actual data that you'll be dealing with? So um, is it extensible? How does it fit in with um, the other parts of whatever uh, the system is. So for example, in analytics, a lot of times we're building data pipelines. So data goes through stages till it gets to the end result. So as it goes through those stages, how do those things all work together? Um, those are some specific things that I, that I think are important when you're thinking about design in the data side. Thank you, everyone. I'm gonna switch things up a bit. Um, and um, just like any, um, just like many of the leadership roles in tech, there is a lack of diversity today in the community of architects across the globe. What ideas do you have um, that we as a global community of technologists could start doing or stop doing? I'm gonna start with Lena, then Michael, then Denise and David on this question. So th thank you, Lisa. I think uh, it's, uh, it's interesting, right? I'll start with an anecdote. So when I actually uh, joined Intuit, we were in a separate uh, location. And when I actually went to the main, the, the headquarters, I was being paraded around as like the woman architect, right? And I, I was like kind of taken aback by that because I had never thought of myself as a woman architect. I just thought of myself as an architect. And initially that kind of, you know, <laughs> you surprised me a little bit, but then, then I realized, oh, I actually indeed was the only woman architect in the, in the group that I had joined. And and it also made me realize because other women, other women also came up to me and started saying, hey, it's so good to see, you know, a woman in this role. And what I realized is while I may not think of myself as a woman architect, just me being in that role, let other women to think that, hey, this is something that they can do. Right. Because I, what I've noticed is a lot of women, uh, they think that the only way to grow in their career is to go like the management route as a, as a way, right? They don't see the IC as a way to grow, like a thought leadership as a way to grow architect. So I said, hey, so this is, so while I've always done mentoring and sponsoring, I said, oh, I need to do a lot more of that and to kind of promote that, hey, this is something, you, you know, women, we need a lot more women principal engineers and a lot more women architects, right? Because guess what? Just that diversity of thought and thinking about, and I, I always tell, hey, women are always good about the details. It's not just about the, the big picture thinking, but how all those details fit together, right? So you, believe me, you know, women can be great architects. I'm not saying men, like, so we all need more. So I, I just think we should just be doing, a, and what you're doing, right? Just having this diverse group of uh, people on this is great because uh, all of us need to just be doing a lot more of that uh, is what I think. Just mentoring and the, the sponsoring and our allies too, right? It's not just the women architects or principal engineers on the panel, but our, but our allies as well. So. Good call, mentoring definitely and elevating and raising others. Thank you. Um, Michael. I think we should consider diversity and diversity means inclusion in everything that we do. And I will just give examples of what I do. So if I need to create a focus group for to solve some technical challenge, I will make sure that some part of this group will be equal representation between in, in terms of gender. Same is when I'm uh, in a steering committee and I'm building agenda for a conference, I'm making sure that we have equal representation uh, of speakers between in terms of gender and uh, and so on. So there, if you just step outside and think, just start thinking about that in everything that you do, you will have plenty of ideas. So those are just some examples. And I think that it's very important. The more we do it, the, the better our world will be. I love the deliberate message that you're making around being deliberate with some of those. Um, David, Denise? Um, I'll just, yeah, just 
I, I love Michael's ideas here because so much of what um, drives women out of tech over time is the day-to-day -day stuff, the death by a thousand cuts. Um, and so the reason that there's fewer women in architect roles is all tied up in why there's fewer women as you go up the ladder and longer, longer tenure, right? There's higher churn. Women leave tech at a much higher rate than men. Women don't advance in general, in aggregate. Um, and so it's all of these things that happen day to day, airtime in meetings, opportunities to work on good projects, right? Set, uh, mentorship and sponsorship. All of these things impact whether or not a woman gets to the stage where she could be, you know, at an art, considered for an architect role or a similar, similar level. So it's, it's on every scrum team member, every manager, every technical lead to ensure that all talent's being nurtured. And that's, that's the only way that we, we stop this leaky pipeline of women leaving tech and therefore not achieving these, these levels. Yeah. I love that you said that it's each of us, not specific people, not just the manager, not just you know, you know, another architect, not just a VP, it's each of us. Thank you, David. Yeah, and I think I, you know, it's really interesting when you think about um, sort of that death by a thousand cuts, right? Like, it is something as small as, you know, talking over someone or, uh, you know, not letting, just sort of dismissing an idea. Um, the fact is, you know, if, if everyone on a team looks like me, we're going to build software for people that look like me. And that's not representative of the world, right? It's not representative of the world in terms of gender, race, ethnic background, sexual orientation, religion, anything, right? And so it's, you know, some of the best teams that I've been on are teams where everyone is different and they bring a different background because it, it not only is it good for the company and for the team members, but it's, it's great for me because I get to see experiences and, and hear points of view that I have never experienced. And I'm like, oh, I learned something today. And that, you know, that, that is really powerful. Um, and so I think it's really important for all of us, you know, to, to your point, not just VPs, right, but even down to SWE ones, to, to be thinking about diversity in all of those areas and to think about, you know, how do we make sure that, um, you know, it's, it's not just all about who, um, you know, who, whose ideas resonate with me because they're my ideas, right? Uh, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, that, that. That guy, he knows what he's talking about because he said the thing that like instantly came into my mind, but really to look at all of the ideas and all of the people in the room and think about how we can build software better together. You all are so inspirational. Thank you for sharing that. We are at now at the portion of, of our uh, webinar where we're going to go straight to the community and we have a lot of questions. So thanks, Vanessa, uh, for helping um, curate these. But I'm going to start actually with the first question that we got. Um, and so panelists, are you all ready? Um, this is just rapid fire again. Whoever wants to take it, take it. And we'll, we'll just keep going through the questions. First question is, um, what percentage of your time does an, an architect like you devote to coding? Um, and then there's a second part of, to, of that, which is how do you stay up to date with advances in tech? So first part is percentage of time devoted to coding. Second is how do you, how do you actually get that outside inspiration? So I think that it really depends on the, it, it really depends on the timing and what you call coding. Sometimes it, coding means actually writing code and sometimes coding means doing POCs and something code, sometimes it means sitting with teams and doing code reviews. But I think that in my perspective, from my experience, it's usually like 20, 30% of the time. It might go out sometimes in, uh, to 50. It really depends on the period. And I remember that uh, the, maybe two years ago, I was kind of, there was a few weeks that I was like 100%. It really depends. Uh, and how I keep myself uh, updated in the tech stacks, uh, so there are plenty of uh, blogs uh, and Safari online. I use this uh, a lot. And this is one of the benefits in, into it that every uh, engineer or technologist have access to this famous library. And there are plenty of books, plenty of case studies, plenty of courses. So it's just, you need, we need to have time. And sometimes I regret that we only have 24 hours. Thank you. Next question. Um, have any of you suffered from imposter syndrome during your career journey and how did you overcome it? Heck yeah. Um, 
So okay. I, I, I laughed when David was talking about his transition to architect and that he thought, oh, yeah, I got this. And then he realized he didn't got this. So, you know, I was working toward this promotion for architect. And I, you know, I, so it was a plan, right? And I had a whole, my manager was helping me. And, and then I got the job and I was like, what exactly is this job? Like I had been so focused on getting the job that I hadn't really thought much about um, what am I do now? Uh, so I remember looking around going, well, that person does it that way and that person does it that way. Uh, but I'm just going to do it my way. And I kind of started carving my own way, but I wasn't really sure I was doing it right for a good chunk of time. <laughs> I mean, even now occasionally, right? I mean, we all have that, those momentary like, oh, they're going to figure out, I don't know what I'm talking about here, um, which is okay. So there's a little bit of fake it till you make it. And there's a little bit of carve your own path, right? Are you, because at the end of the day, kidding aside, am I delivering the outcome? So the, the, the barometer on whether I'm effective as an architect is, are we achieving what the business needs out of whatever it is I'm working on? Are my customers satisfied by whatever solutions we're delivering? That's if I'm doing the job right. What, you know, and then there's a bunch of ways to, to get there, right? So, but yeah, yeah. definitely experience that. Actually, I agree. I agree with Denise. I think the best thing is when your engineers come and tell you, hey, you know, your designs are the best, right? You write the best shovel ready stories. Like you make my job faster as an engineer or your stakeholders tell you, right? I think that is, I don't think we can say, oh, I'm a good architect, you know, on your own, right? Really, because at the end of the day, you're doing design for, to solve a certain problem as Michael earlier was talking about, right? That customer obsession. So in our case, it's our stakeholders that tell us that, right? And, and the quality of what we design. So, yeah. I suffer from imposter syndrome all the time. Uh, when I was asked to do this webinar, I was like, I looked at the rest of the panelists and I'm like, I, the one of these does not belong, right? Like, uh, I'm like yeah, everyone else has been doing this longer than me. I, this isn't me. I, someone else needs to be picked. Um, you know, it's, it's frequent, right? And it doesn't really go away. Um, you know, because the problem space always grows. Like you, you get more and more things thrust at you and you wake up and sort of look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, who put me in charge of this? Like, <laughs> there's, there's no way I'm not ready for this. Um, and so you just, you know, you have to sort of believe that like the people who put you in that role are, um, they know what they're doing, or at least they have imposter syndrome as well, because they pretend like they know what they're doing. But then internally, they probably also wake up and go like, who put me in charge of this? <laughs> and so there's an element of that in all of us. Um, okay, next question. How do you handle conflict um, between architects and engineers or between your point of view and an engineer's point of view? We have a draw off. Where we, where we, <laughs> who, can, who can draw, <laughs> draw the best diagram? Yeah. <laughs> Who's got the best diagram? Um, I mean, conflict is going to come, right? There's people are passionate about what they do. And so there's always going to be different points of view. And, and goodness, there's so many technological options for pretty much any problem you have in front of you, right? Um, and people can get quite attached to ideas. Um, I try to, I do try to do a couple things. One is I try to put structure around the discussion itself, right? So there's clarity on, at the, we all have opinions, but at the end of the day, who's making the decision? So we try to get that clear up front. Um, and I try really hard, and I don't always succeed at this, but I try really hard to ensure that someone's facilitating the discussion so that everyone gets airtime who has something to say. And if you're involved in the de debate yourself, that can be harder to do which then you should actually ask someone else to facilitate it. If you're one of the people who's gonna have a lot to say. Um, and it has to be okay to, well, two things, disagree and commit. At the end of the day, decisions made and we all, okay, I don't agree, but I can commit to it. And it's not personal, right? None of it's personal. Like which database you choose is not a reflection on you as a human being, right? It's hopefully weighing out the, the features of two different databases and making the best choice for your organization. Anyone else want to add to that? So what I usually do is that, first of all, there, when, when there is, conflicts are good. I think that because they are good because that's how we learn from it. There, there are different opinions and uh, different uh, points of view, so it's good. And no matter how we tackle them. So I think that the structure, my, kind of my secret sauce is to first of all, to understand each side, go and do follow me homes and understand each side so and each side understand the other side. And then once we understand each other, we define the principles. What is the good solution? How do we know which option will we go? How do we know that it's a good one? So we create those principles and then we create solutions or 
alternatives. And then we evaluate using these options and uh, do, using these principles. And that's how we actually make a decision what path to go. I really hope that none of the engineers that I'm working with are listening to this because they'll realize that this is like a technique that I use. But um, I really like to, if we're like arguing about something philosophical in terms of like, well, this, it should be done this way or it should be done that way. Um, I will grab them and be like, hey, come help me solve this problem. And I will open the IDE and we will start writing code together because then it turns into sort of not, you know, you versus me versus the other person, but more into us versus the compiler. And the compiler doesn't really care about your philosophy. It cares about whether or not the code can work. How did you write it? <laughs> and, and so it's like, hey, okay, I understand your philosophy on this, but like, how do I get this piece of data from here over to here? And how do I get it to render on the screen? And then they're like, oh, all right. Well, I guess we should just like put it through this. You know, we should like create this class over here and we should do this. And I'm like, there we go. Now we're, now we're all collaborating around beating the compiler. So... Again, Ooh. I hope none of them are listening to this. <laughs> I now love it. Like you're tr you're playing that trick on me, and I'm like, sorry. <laughs> These are not the droids you're looking for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. These are really great, and we have so many more questions. We just I'm looking at the time, and I really I want to get to to this next thing, which is I'm asking each of you as panelists um, if you could say one or two things that attendees today should take away from our talk or from the stories you've shared, what would it be? I'm gonna start with um, Lena, then Michael, Denise, then David. So the one to two things that you want them to take away. So I would say uh, know the domain that you're building the solution for and considering the architect role in your career path. Uh, go talk to the person playing the architect role in your team and if there isn't one, hey, there's an opportunity for you. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, two, two areas. Uh, first, that architects must be multifaceted, and that means that if I'm back-end engineer, then you know, I want to be an uh, architect, I need to expand my horizons and know what is front-end engineering, data engineering, what is security, and many other disciplines and areas, because after all, I need to work with multiple teams, help them make decisions, and I need to talk to the language and to understand the areas. Uh, that's from one side. From the other side, as architect, architects cannot be wizards who sit in the very high towers. They need to wizards. be part of the teams. You should be connected to them and be part of them and have people skills and leadership skills and all together. So I think that those are two areas. Thank you, Denise. So I guess two pieces of advice. Um, if you're interested in pursuing this as a role um, for your career is you need to be excited and energized by technology itself and how quickly it's changing and not to be intimidated or overwhelmed. We're all overwhelmed. It's just going so fast and there's so many new services all the time, that's okay. Um, Web's Google is your friend. If you're not sure what something is, you just have to find out. Um, so that's part of it and it's exciting, right? Because there's lot, always more opportunities to do new things. And the other side of it is what Michael, I think was just um, talking about, which is the power of influence or the importance of influence in the role of the architect. We talked several times today about communicating with our engineering team and about communicating with our stakeholders, right? We have to be able to tell a story and bring people along in order to achieve the goals that we have in our heads. So influencing is a really important skill. Thank you, Denise. David. Yeah, I think for the, for the engineers that are looking to become an architect, it's, um, you know, understand, I, I think the advice to like go talk to the architect in your team is great because it, um, I don't think I did enough of that when I was an engineer. I, I think I thought I knew what it was. And then, like I said, when I got the role, I was like, oh, I need to work on some things, lots of things. Um, you know, and it's, it's because it's more than just technology. It is so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's connecting to what the business needs and, and what designers need and what PMs need and what the customer needs. And like, it's, it's so many different uh, aspects other than just, the technology. Um, and then, you know, for the architects who are in the audience today, I would say, I think that too many of us sort of fall into that trap of the wizard in the tower where it's like, I am, I am busy and important and I'm like writing the documents and making the PowerPoints and I, I have to go present to the senior leadership. Um, when really like presenting to senior leadership is not what makes you successful. Uh, sorry to all senior leadership who are listening to this. Um, it's really making sure that the engineers are are able to 
be effective at their job. If you can make the engineers happy, you will be far more successful than if you uh, perfect that set of slides for senior leadership. Well said, everyone. Um, I want to thank all of you um, out there in the audience for joining us. I want to thank our panelists for joining us in this edition of Intuit Tech Stories. Um, we are so happy that you all were part of it today. And please do stay tuned for an email with the recording and survey about today's session. Um, we'd also like to invite you to check out intuit.com 